Welcome to Dr. Noel program. We are committed to bring to our viewers medical specialists to discuss the different medical issues that concerns them during their life. In tonight's episode, we have Dr. Brett Courtney. He's an orthopedic surgeon at St. Vincent's Hospital, and he is an associate professor uh, at the University of New South Wales and the Notre Dame University. Dr. Courtney's uh, special interest is adult hip and knee surgery and trauma. Welcome, Dr. Courtney, and thanks for accepting our invitation for coming here tonight. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. <clears throat> In tonight's episode, we will be talking about the various types of arthritis and what uh, our viewers need to know. <clears throat> Before we start talking about arthritis, Dr. Courtney, may you please explain how our joints in the body work and how they get deteriorated. Yes, thank you. The joints in our body are some of the most complex parts of our anatomy. We grow a bearing surface on the end of each bone and we grow that when we basically are floating in our mother's womb in the first nine months of our life. When we are born, that bearing surface on the end of the bone is the thickest it will ever be for our entire life. It gets broader, it gets larger and longer, but it will never get thicker from that moment we are born. That bearing surface gets its nutrition from fluid produced by the lining of our joint. And it's a very complicated process that's involved with us using our joints, with the pressure on our joints, walking and moving and exercising as we go. As we get older, that bearing surface gets thinner and thinner. And there are many reasons why that happens. Some of it's genetics, some of it's if we are unfortunate enough to have an accident and that can damage the joint surfaces as well. And people who are very overweight and don't exercise very much, they also accelerate that wear out process. But the wearing and deterioration of our joints is inevitable. And if we all live long enough, we are going to wear out our joints, particularly on our load-bearing joints. In other words, those of our lower limbs, primarily our hips and our knees. Uh, thanks, Dr Courtney. Uh, so may you please explain what is arthritis? Yes, arthritis <coughs> is really a very general term. Um, and it tends to cover a lot of the aches and pains that we suffer as we progress through life. From a medical point of view, there are various forms of arthritis. We refer to primary osteoarthritis, and that's that condition where we see the deformed fingers of our mothers and our grandmothers, and that's definitely inherited. In addition to that, we can get secondary osteoarthritis directly related to disease processes that go on. People who have gout that's not well treated are more prone to wear out their joints. And then there's also a whole series of disease processes. The most common of all that people would be aware of is rheumatoid arthritis, where there is a generalised body disease that will actually go and cause those joints to deteriorate. They tend to forget, uh, affect many parts of the body, uh, many joints, and also particularly with rheumatoid arthritis and some of its variants, people might get problems such as dry eyes, they also might get problems with breathing, they might get problems with their kidney function as well. They're separate disease processes that need to be investigated by a, a good practitioner to explore them. And many of those conditions, thankfully they're rarer, but many of those actually have specific treatments that can certainly slow the process down. And I think we're at a, case, a situation today where some of those disease processes may even be able to be reversed and cured. It's a big call for very crippling diseases, but some of the best research done at the moment is in these, what we refer to as inflammatory arthritis. But the majority, and certainly what we're going to talk about this evening, is the wear and tear arthritis, often referred to as osteoarthritis. And that's what happens basically as we get older. So, may we be able to stop arthritis? No. In a word, no. I think there's a lot that we can do to ameliorate the symptoms from it, to reduce them, to keep our joints going as long as we can. 
but I don't really believe at the moment we have the technology that can actually stop us developing arthritis. We will talk a little later about some of the claims by some areas, but I really don't think there's evidence to show that we can stop it happening. So if we cannot stop arthritis, what may we do to slow down its impact? Correct. The most important thing we need to do is exercise. Unfortunately, there is no simple solution. One needs to do at least three or four times a week an exercise of about 40 to 60 minutes of exercise that's continuous, that exercise that we can feel our body under some degree of strain. An exercise that if we are walking and we're talking to someone, that exercise, it would be sufficient so that we could have we could carry on a conversation, but we would actually have trouble completing a sentence without taking a breath. So we need to push ourselves during that. It needs to be continuous, and it really needs to be at three or four times a week. So to make it uh, easier for the viewer, it means when we are walking, we have to go a bit fast. We have to push ourselves so we will feel we are under some strain. But not as, as fast where we are still able to talk, but... That's a minimum. Okay. How much further we go beyond that is up to individuals. But people who regard exercise as wandering around a shopping centre for an hour really aren't doing themselves a favour. Okay, so that's not exercise. (laughs) And following a dog that's walking even slower than people are is also not exercise. It must be exercise under physical demands to the body. Okay. Uh, Dr Courtney, what do you uh, think of physiotherapy and massages for Physiotherapy and massage and those type of treatments are very effective in acute episodes. With arthritis, as our joints start to deteriorate, we'll get good days and we'll get some bad days. If we have trouble exercising, if our joints are too sore, or if we're unfortunate of twisting or hurting something, then we're not going to be able to do the exercise as well the following day. And that's where something like massage and physiotherapy can help. What we actually massage into our joints probably doesn't matter. There are shelves of proprietary substances sold that are supposed to be better than one, are, one another, but really simple sorbolene cream and massi- massage into sore joints is probably as good as anything. And physiotherapy can help. If we have a joint that is sore, we can't actually get started an exercise, that exercise can actually help reverse that process and it can actually get people to get started again. It is not a substitute for the exercises. You can't pay for someone else to do your exercise. You need to do it yourself. So again, all of these are to facilitate us getting back to doing our three to four episodes of exercise a week. Okay, so uh, looking at different aspects, and there are many treatments in the market at the moment if you go see different specialists, uh, medical and maybe just naturopath and all that stuff. What do you think of acupuncture? Yeah, acupuncture uh, does seem to work. It seems to be a little unpredictable in what it's going to do. Um, it's the evidence for acupuncture would suggest it has a good place in treatment of low back problems and it probably is more effective than some of the conventional anti-inflammatories. Whether it has a place in osteoarthritis, for instance, of the knee or hip, uh, is a bit undecided, and I suspect it doesn't. But certainly it does work, but it's unpredictable, and uh, certainly no downside to people trying it. But generally I would expect people to get a benefit if they've got problems with their back, possibly neck, but less likely with their hip and knee. Okay. Uh, Dr. Courtney, many people swear uh, of the value of the supplements they take. Yeah. What are your views on that? Yeah. Look, there's a lot of supplements that are advertised. There's, they fall into a number of various groups. The, uh, the two broader groups that fall into are those, the various fish oils, um, krill oils and other substances like that. A recent study in the UK that looked at 14,000 uh, people who'd been on them for a significant period of time really couldn't find any real benefit from them. 
Uh, but I think fish oil is essential. It's an important part of what we have and we should have in our diet. And there's a fair bit of evidence to suggest, even though a good piece of fish doesn't have quite as much fish oil as a tablet, it's probably more effectively absorbed from the body. So I would always advise patients to have fish a couple times a week so that they get a good balanced diet from doing it. And the second supplement that broad group is glucosamine. And glucosamine comes with chondroitin or some other products. And they're very, each company will have its own additive. I believe that's probably to give them a marketing edge rather than science. Glucosamine itself actually does have some evidence to support it, but the evidence isn't very solid and follow-up studies haven't been as convincing. I would always recommend that a patient uses glucosamine for a period of time of about a month. It is simple, it's safe, it's cheap, and it has minimal side effects. Thanks, Dr. Courtney. And we will take a short break and we'll come back. Thank you. Welcome back to the Dr. Noel program. We'll continue discussing uh, arthritis with Dr. Brett Courtney. Dr. Courtney, uh, thanks for explaining about the uh, supplements. Uh, what are the pharmaceutical medications that can be uh, used for treatment of arthritis? The first thing is that we're not actually treating the arthritis as in altering the disease process. What we are doing is we are giving medication or treatment to actually modify its symptoms. The simplest is simple pain relief, simple analgesics, and one of the more effective ones, and certainly one of the safest, is paracetamol. And paracetamol comes in various forms. Uh, more recently, we have had available in Australia slow re release paracetamol, and, uh, and that has proved to be very, very effective. It is safe. It is not, does not accumulate in the body. It does not have long-term impacts on the kidneys or any other major organs in the body. And the body just excretes it basically every day. In addition to those, there are the anti-inflammatory medications, which are very effective. They help to reduce the inflammation in the joint, and they also help to relieve symptoms. Generally, however, they are not recommended for long-term use. Even the newer classes of anti-inflammatories run a big risk on long-term impact on kidneys and for many patients can actually adversely affect blood pressure and blood pressure control. So the recommendation is to start simple but start on a regular basis. To take the paracetamol on a daily basis even before you think you're going to have a problem and to preempt any pain by taking appropriate medication before you actually stir up that joints. Uh, lately there were some studies where they were talking about uh, anti-inflammatory uh, tablets like which something you get over the counter uh, causing stroke. What are your views on that? The, the anti-inflammatories as a group the traditional anti-inflammatories do have an aspirin type effect and they actually can cause some bleeding because they affect platelets, which is an important part of blood clotting in the body. Some of the other anti-inflammatories, and there was one in particular in the US that was used in a particular trial, but that actually caused increased risks of clotting with claim to be increased risks of heart attack and possibly stroke. So I think it reflects that the anti-inflammatories are effective drugs, and yes, there are risks with these, but they are the second line of defence that you would use, not your primary ones, whereas you don't get the same sort of risks with paracetamol. Okay. So uh, does it make any difference, for example, like if you use some most anti-inflammatories, they have them in tablets form, but also they have the topical creams. Well, obviously it's working, not maybe directly, it's just by absorption, it might give the same impact, is it, or? The, the anti-inflammatory creams are sold 
in large quantities. The one of the more commonly sold ones over the counter has the equivalent of about two tablets in the cream. Uh, I am led to believe that it is absorbed through the body. I have my own doubts. But even if it is absorbed through the skin around our knee joint, there is no physical connection between the skin of my knee and my knee joint. So if it is absorbed into the skin through that massage around the knee, it has to go through the entire body before it actually comes back to that knee again. And when you consider a whole tube of one of the more popular creams only has the equivalent of two tablets in it, I am somewhat doubtful of its efficacy. I think it works by massage, and I mentioned that earlier, and I think massage with creams uh, can be quite symptomatically beneficial to a sore joint. Okay, so, but the question, does it have the same blood thinning impact if it's absorbed through the skin or your massage or just taking the tablets? I'm not a pharmacologist, but I believe <laughs> there's so small quantity in the cream that I don't think it does anything. So therefore, I can't even say it's going to cause a complication. Okay, okay. okay let's change a bit, uh, Dr. Courtney. Uh, what do you think of the cort cortisone injection yes. directly into, into the, the joint? joint? Yep. The uh, cortisone has been used for a long period of time. There is still a lot of debate about how effective it is. But in my own clinical practice, I think in a patient that has an acute flare of a knee, of a joint, particularly the knee, but also in a hip, and acute pain, it can often be very beneficial in helping to calm the symptoms down. We know the cortisone is a powerful anti-inflammatory. And, um, and I've had, and true, it is anecdotal, but many patients who have got over an acute episode of a knee and it's settled them down, allowed them to get back to exercise, and uh, it's been often many, many months before they get an acute flare again, well beyond the length of one would expect the drug to work. So I think it does have a, an effect on those patients. But obviously uh, it doesn't help every person no, because no. from experience in uh, imaging, we know some people would swear by it, you know, they say it was great, where some people say nothing happened. Correct. So. Correct. And the other thing too is repeated doses of cortisone in the long term will actually have a detrimental effect on the joint surfaces. So I would only ever use it in a joint that's already badly damaged. So you're not worrying about damaging joint further. You're trying to get symptom, symptomatic improvement to help the patient save him from something more complicated. Uh, Dr. Courtney, what other things can be injected into yes. the joint? In addition to cortisone, there is an interest in injecting the natural lubricant of our joints back into our joints. The evidence for that is not very rewarding and it's only useful in the very earliest phases. So I think the interest in that is de decreasing. Okay, uh, Dr. Courtney, uh, what are the investigations or the best investigation for arthritis? The first thing I would always recommend is a plain X-ray, and particularly in a knee joint, a weight-bearing X-ray. If we are looking for possible fractures, CT scanning can work. But if everything else isn't giving us a diagnosis, MRI is excellent in the early stages, but it's not the definitive one in the advanced stages. Are there any uh, simple surgical interventions that can delay the uh, deterioration of joints? Yeah. The simple answer is no. Arthroscopy has traditionally been used in joints to try and clean up the joint, to reduce some of that inflammation in the joint. It really doesn't work and it can actually make knees worse by doing it. It does, however, have a place if there are mechanical symptoms in the joint. If someone has a chip of bone that's floating around, that's locking and jamming, has a piece of soft tissue, a meniscus, that's locking and jamming and causing that joint to uh, lose function temporarily, arthroscopy can be very helpful in those. But in general arthritis, no, it doesn't, and it probably makes it worse. Dr. Courtney, when the pain becomes unbearable and the patient becomes almost disabled, or the knee, for example, What's the final treatment? Yeah. 
The final definitive treatment is joint replacement, where both sides of the joint are replaced by artificial material. And they're done in hips and knees primarily, but also in shoulders and ankles. Uh, thank you, Dr. Courtney. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess surgical uh, intervention uh, qualifies for an episode, episode on its own. And if you are kind enough to have you back uh, for another episode sometime in the future, that will be great. Thank you very much, James. Thanks to our viewers for watching uh, this episode. And we will make sure we'll invite Dr. Courtney to come back and discuss many other orthopedic issues. Thank you. See you next time.